Isn't fashion strange? It seems that a lot of people will go to enormous expense to be fashionable. This is nothing new. Being fashionable throughout history has not only been impractical and uncomfortable, it's often been downright dangerous. Fashion has often displayed status, and one of the best ways of showing that you are cut above the others is to dress in a way that makes normal work very difficult. It's making a statement. You're saying, I don't need to work because I have other people to do it for me. In the middle of the 19th century, fashionable women wore crinolines. As you can see, they are phenomenally impractical. In effect, they created a barrier around the woman, making simple everyday actions difficult, if not impossible. As in every fashion, people from all walks of life started to copy their social superiors. The extreme size of the crinolines and the inflammability of the material used made crinolines incredibly dangerous. Wearing such elaborate dresses in the presence of open fires that were the main source of heating at the time was indeed a recipe for disaster. It is estimated that during the 1850s and the late 1860s, in England alone, about 3,000 women were killed in crinoline-related fires. In 1864, a study reported that over the previous 14 years, at least 39,000, nearly 40,000 women worldwide died in crinoline-related fires. Although flame retardant fabrics were available, these were thought to be unattractive and were unpopular. Records show that makeup has been in use for at least the last 4,000 years, probably a lot more. And for most of this period, the two most popular ingredients have been lead and arsenic, not exactly the most safe ingredients. And the dangers of being fashionable are not just a thing of the past. We could also talk about the health dangers of stiletto heels, first worn by men, and high heels in general. This apparent craziness is not just the domain of women. You only have to think back to the 1970s to see that men were just as guilty with their flared trousers and platform shoes, which caused an incredible number of twisted, sprained, and in some cases, broken ankles. I'm only glad there is no photographic evidence of myself at that time. Makeup was also frequently used by men throughout the ages. One question though that I've always asked myself is that why, from the 1660s right up to the 1790s, a period of nearly 150 years, did people wear wigs when they had perfectly normal hair of their own? I think this fashion is unique to this period, at least as a fashion that is so widespread. For nearly all human history, long hair was the norm for women and men. There were some short hair periods for men, but they were the exception. In most periods, long hair was a sign of virility and status. It was also easier to manage. As barber shops and hairdressers didn't exist, this was quite convenient. Baldness was seen as something that was quite unfortunate, and some bald men had always made use of wigs. Then Europe had a very unwelcome visitor. Syphilis. The first known outbreaks of syphilis in Europe occurred in 1495, but in the 17th century it spread like wildfire. Terrible wars of the period made things worse, and remember, there was no cure, no antibiotics. The symptoms of syphilis were terrible. They could include fever, swollen lymph nodes, sore throat, patchy hair loss, and a lot of hair loss indeed, headaches, weight loss, muscular aches, fatigue, and that was the easy thing. You can still get that now if you catch syphilis before it's cured with antibiotics. The symptoms at the time included loss of hands, limbs, blindness, and many other terrible afflictions, normally resulting in death. The most widespread symptoms and the earliest were hair loss, sometimes patchy, sometimes total, and sores on the head. Now these symptoms can be produced by lots of other conditions, but rather than have people think you had 
syphilis, it was better to cover the head with a wig. This period in the middle of the 17th century, when syphilis was so widespread, coincided with what is known as the beginning of the mini ice age. This was a period between about 1650 and 1715, when the Northern Hemisphere cooled significantly due to um, less radiation from the sun at low, or shall we say lower solar activity and aerosols from a lot of volcanoes. So this meant that the temperature was much lower. Just think at that time, the River Thames regularly froze over. So wearing a wig when the temperature was lower was less comfortable than it would be, say, now. And so wigs wearing became more and more widespread. But two very famous men really promoted the fashion of wearing wigs. It wasn't their intention, but as these were both kings, people started to follow them. One was Louis XIV, King of France, a very powerful king, at that time probably the most powerful monarch in the whole of Europe, and consequently the world. He was known as the Sun King. I'm not sure why, maybe he thought the sun shined out of, well, never mind that. And the other was Charles II of England, Scotland and Ireland. And he was monarch of an increasingly powerful nation and at a time when the foundations of the future British Empire were being laid. Louis XIV went bold prematurely and consequently we cannot have a powerful monarch walking around with what could potentially be the symptoms of syphilis. There are those who say that he did have syphilis, but we will never know. So he started wearing long elaborate wigs as you can see here. Charles II, it is believed, went prematurely grey and then started losing his hair and so started wearing wigs for the same reason. Naturally, people followed the fashions of the monarchy. Despite the general cooling of the climate, wigs were pretty uncomfortable in the summer and sweaty and smelly. And after the early 1700s, the, the climate started to get warmer again. One way of dealing with smelly wigs was to use perfumed powder. And these powders were generally colored. And so wigs started to take on very, very strong colors. Also, during the 1700s, wigs became incredibly elaborate, as you can see here. However, there were advantages of wigs. This was a time when hair care was much more complicated than it is now, and head lice were extremely common. Nitpicking, which is now an idiom to mean having excessive attention to detail, was getting the lice eggs out of people's hair with fine combs a long and uncomfortable process. If your head was shaved or, or cut very short and you wore a wig, it was easy just to boil the wig to get rid of the nits. And so it went on. Wigs became very elaborate for men and for women. Women had much more elaborate wigs than men. And in many cases, again, with candles and open fires, wigs could be quite dangerous as the materials were horsehair, <laughs> for poorer people wool, but lots of other materials, including human hair. Um, poor people would often sell their hair to wig makers. And indeed, in countries like Russia, where serfdom, a kind of slavery, continued at least for another hundred years into the 1870s, or 1860s, I can't remember, then serfs were often forced to give their hair over for the making of wigs. And this continued until something happened. At the end of the 18th century, shorter haired wigs became more popular. And in general, the fashion for wigs started to decline. This decline was accelerated by the French Revolution in which the elaborate wigs were associated with the aristocracy and generally not safe things to wear. But already in other parts of the world, wigs were going out of fashion. If you look at George Washington here, it looks like he's wearing a wig of the time. But no, indeed, he styled his hair to look like a wig and then used white powder to colour it. In the outbreak of the Napoleonic Wars, the British government 
imposed a tax on powder, powder for wigs or powder for hair. And so wigs went out of fashion because they became too expensive. Although wigs are still worn by many people for various reasons, they are no longer a widespread or a mainstream fashion. Lawyers in Britain and some other Commonwealth countries, lawyers and judges, I should say, continue to wear wigs. There is some debate about whether wigs should continue to be worn by lawyers and judges in British and some Commonwealth countries. There are many who say that these are a relic of the past and should be eliminated. The people who support the use of wigs say that it is like a mask. It, it means that you see the judge and the lawyer as part of the legal process and not as a person. Certainly, having seen a lawyer without the wig and seen the same lawyer in court, I can say that they look like totally different people. So maybe they are right, at least in part. So there we have it. Wigs lasted for almost a century and a half. That's pretty incredible, even by the standards of the fashions of the past. Will any fashion last that long in the future? I doubt it. Will wigs come back? Who knows? They may do. There is um, a theory that uh, there will be a, a computer interface with the human brain, which will mean that everybody needs to be bald in order to have a, this cap which will interface with a computer. You need to read the books of Arthur C. Clarke to, to find out about this. I have no idea whether this has any scientific validity or no. All I can say is that fashion is weird. If you enjoyed this episode, please click like and subscribe and share it with your friends. Bye for now.